Hello, my name's Kim Eagle. I'm the editor of ACC.org, and we're here at ACC 18 with uh, two very wonderful faculty from our ACC.org team. Salim Varani, Associate Professor at Baylor College of Medicine, also at the Michael DeBakey VA Medical Center, and Tina Shah, also at that same institution, an Assistant Professor. And we're here to discuss today a couple of trials in the area of prevention that I think are very interesting. The whole field of prevention for cardiovascular disease is changing with the addition of new classes of drugs that may affect how we care for patients going forward. And we're going to talk about three trials today. We're going to talk about Cantos, Canvas, and Odyssey. And I'm going to start with Salim. Give us your thoughts about Cantos. Right, so for our viewers, uh, this was a multi-center, multinational study of about 10,000 patients post-myocardial infarction who were randomized to placebo versus canakinumab, an interleukin-1 beta monoclonal antibody. And for these particular analyses that we're discussing today, the question that the investigators wanted to answer was that does canakinumab reduce incident diabetes? And this was based on some prior data showing that inflammation plays a key role not just in cardiovascular disease uh, and events related to that, but also in the development of diabetes. So for these particular analyses, they looked at patients who were pre-diabetics, which was a pretty large proportion of patients in Canto's trial, and then they followed them for uh, 3.7 years, and then looked at whether the use of canakinumab was associated with a reduction in incident diabetes. So that was what the investigators wanted to do. Obviously, they also looked at whether HACRP levels predicted incident diabetes, and that would be confirmatory because we knew, knew that from prior uh, studies as well. So what they found was that HACRP levels as well as interleukin-6 levels did predict incident diabetes. So that was not anything new. We knew that from before. But the main question that they wanted to answer was whether incidence of diabetes was reduced by blocking interleukin-1-beta using this monoclonal antibody. And there we did not see a signal. So the use of canakinumab was not associated with a reduction in the incidence of diabetes. On the other hand, when we look at major cardiovascular events, the reduction in major cardiovascular events was similar whether patients were diabetics or non-diabetics in this particular study. So just to summarize, there was a reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events with the use of canakinumab, but incident diabetes did not go down with the use of this particular therapy. And as we knew from before, HACRP level or inflammatory markers were associated with incident diabetes. I was a little worried that perhaps the diabetics would be at higher risk for some of the complications, the safety issues, like life-threatening infection. Correct. And in this study, it looked to me like that was null, that there was no signal for that. Is exactly. That right? Overall, that's a, that's a very good point. And overall, initial, as you know, the initial manuscript when it was published, the main top-line results, right. there was an increase in you know fatal infections as well as sepsis, whereas here it did not seem like the diabetics we're getting more fatal infection right. sepsis compared to non-diabetic, so that's a little bit reassuring. Yeah, that was a concern I had, and it looks like that's been uh, uh, taken care of. So let's move to Canvas, which mm -hmm. is another type mm -hmm. of new drug that we're seeing. Right, so in Canvas, basically, this is a multi-center, uh, multinational trial, but it's really a program. It's a combination of two studies, and they basically, in this study that was published now, were trying to see what the effects of canaflozin is on um, heart failure patients, and patients with and without heart failure. And what they showed basically in the trial was that the drug actually reduces uh, cardiovascular death and uh, heart failure hospitalizations, hospitalized heart failure, that's what they cause it. That was a composite endpoint. And there was a significant reduction with the drug compared to placebo. And, and there, there was a signal that the effect was maybe slightly more in patients who were already who already had heart failure. So this is very interesting. In 2008, the FDA made a decision to change the way diabetes trials were managed right. and cardiovascular endpoints became a big focus. Right. And now we're seeing this whole new class of what's an SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2 inhibitor. And what's this mechanism do we think? How might this class of drugs affect heart failure? 
So there are, uh, I don't think it's fully understood, but there are some hypotheses on what we think might be the mechanisms of how these drugs act. Uh, one of the proposed mechanisms is that it actually acts on the renal tubules and it affects the sodium glucose mm -hmm. absorption there and uh, affects in some ways the diuresis and that's how it helps in patients with heart failure. There's also another hypothesis that they talk about in this trial where they suggest that they may also have some metabolic effects on uh, sort of the ketones and the glucose metabolism and since the failing hearts use ketones for their metabolism, it may have some helpful beneficial effects in that sort of pathway. Right. So I don't think we fully understand, but these are sort of the mechanisms that have been touted as possible reasons for why these drugs are especially beneficial in heart failure. So they have big effects. They may affect heart muscle, they may mm -hmm. affect heart blood or blood vessels, mm -hmm. they might affect the kidney. Kidneys. So um, certainly much more to learn about this class of drugs, but it's exciting uh, to think that we may have diabetes therapies that have a secondary benefit on the most Absolutely. dreaded complication, cardiovascular disease. And then comes Odyssey. So the Odyssey study was presented just a couple of hours here at the ACC 18 uh, meeting. Gabrielle Steg presented an 18,000 patient study. These are people who've had an ACS event in the last 12 months who are randomized to PS PCSK9 inhibitor or placebo. Uh, and the main endpoint of the study was, was met. About a 15% reduction of PCSK9 inhibitors on an overall MACE rate. Interesting, the, the drug lowered LDL cholesterols in patients who are already on pretty high dose statins from about 90 to about 40. And at the end of the study, over about three years, the LDL levels were around 50 in the treated group. One of the interesting subgroup analyses that we saw was that the PCSK9 inhibitor, alirucumab, seemed to reduce endpoints, particularly in patients who had an LDL over 100 already on moderate or high intensity statin. So this could be a subgroup where we see particular benefit. These are expensive drugs, so we're really looking for a sweet spot where this class of agents might particularly be beneficial to our patients. You, you saw Odyssey, what were your impressions? Yeah, I think the same uh, you know, things that you pointed out, that now we have two trials of PCSK9 inhibitors in a secondary prevention population, one that is a stable ACVD population, what we had last year, 4A, and now with Odyssey outcomes, you know, a little bit of a higher risk ACS kind of population. So now we have, we're moving towards that level where we have two RCTs showing that the drug is beneficial in patients with established cardiovascular disease. So I think apart from showing that yes, it does work in ACS setting, I think uh, it gave us a little bit more to think about where is that sweet spot? What are really the patients where we can target these drugs exactly because of the reason you mentioned? The cost can be prohibitive if we yes. just give it to every patient right. who has ACVD. But I guess it leaves the door open. We still do not know what to do with our high-risk primary prevention patients because you know, unfortunately, SPIRE studies, SPIRE 1 and SPIRE 2, yeah. which had, you know, a good proportion, 15 to 20% of primary prevention, high-risk primary prevention patients, obviously those studies were stopped prematurely because of the development of the antibody. So that area is still open. We do not yeah. know much about what to do with PCSK9 inhibitors and high-risk primary prevention. But for secondary, we are very certain now that the, this class of medication works. Obviously, the question now to figure out is, out of this secondary prevention population, who are really the patients who will derive the most benefit from this very expensive therapy? Right. So these three trials give you a glimpse of our future. Uh, IL-1 inhibition, inf inflammation, suppressing inflammation with patients who've already reached an LDL goal. Will that be effective? And what are the side effects and safety profiles? The SGLT2 drugs that are used in diabetes. This may be a very important class for cardiologists managing patients with diabetes and coronary disease or heart failure. And then Odyssey, a second trial looking at PCSK9 inhibition, dramatically lowering LDL. Uh, we need a lot more. The drugs are expensive. Each of these classes are very expensive. So we need more trials and more subgroup analysis to tell us exactly where we want to go. I want to thank Salim and Tina for joining us today, and uh, thank you for listening. To